Hello again, friends, and thank you for tuning into the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast, the show where I do a little ranting, raving, and wand waving. I am your host, Paige, and it is the first episode of the year. Yay! I'm really excited to say that I have an interview with Fiona Horn, 90s rock star turned world famous witch turned radio DJ, Playboy cover girl, commercial pilot, humanitarian, and kind of all around inspirational human being uh, about her new book, The Naked Witch. Fiona and I are going to talk about her past as the most famous rock star witch of the late 90s, early 2000s uh, with her band Def FX, who I saw someone on YouTube describe as, what was it? It was Blondie meets Faith No More meets Ministry, which I think is like the best description of Def FX. Uh, We're going to talk about not defining yourself by her physical age and reinventing yourself throughout your life. Uh, The magical truth about how serving others can can change who you are, transformation, and uh, why she is absolutely a fucking feminist. It's pretty great. (laughs) So thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm really excited about it. Before I get to our interview, I want to talk a little bit about The Naked Witch. The Naked Witch is Fiona's autobiography. It just uh, came out here in Canada and the U.S. recently. Last year, it started coming into Canada. I recently posted the review of The Naked Witch on my blog at fatfeministwitch.com. So you can see that I gave it four crystal balls out of a possible five. And that means that I loved this book. It is it is honestly just a wild ride from beginning to end. It's it's inspirational, it's sad, it's shocking at times. It's really it's funny like all the way through. It's it's really beautiful and it's just super super honest. Um Fiona has led like almost like it's almost like she's lived multiple lives in a really short span of time and it's all because she's got a real hell of a survival instinct and the drive and ability to you know, burn everything down and just start from scratch and and build something totally new. It's no wonder she dances with fire. And, you know, that's what she's doing on the cover of the book. It's, it's Fiona and she's, she's dancing with her, her. It's no wonder, I guess that she, uh, she dances with fire because she's definitely got a lot of that Phoenix rising from the ashes energy, uh, all the way through the book. So it's written super, super comfortably. It's more like you're sitting there with Fiona and she's telling you her life story, which is about (laughs) what's going to happen in a few minutes when we get to the episode, but you're really going to want to check out the book. It's super easy to read. I, I blew through it in like two days and the whole time it really reminded me of another memoir by a woman in the music industry, though quite different, um, that I love and have read a million times, which is I'm With the Band by Pamela DeBar. So if you've ever read any of Pamela DeBar, uh, I think you will really, really like The Naked Witch. Like I said, it's very different. Uh, Fiona was the musician and the head of the band, whereas um, Pamela was in a different part of the music industry. She was a professional appreciator of music, as I like to call myself. So... (laughs) Um, So when I got to the end of the book, I had that similar feeling where... I had related so strongly to this, uh, which was odd because, you know, I used to watch these music videos on MTV. and <laughs> So it was really exciting to find, it's always exciting to find that, um, that people are all the same, really. We all go through the same struggles and the same pain and <laughs> we can all come out of it much stronger afterwards. I really loved the design of the book of The Naked Witch. It, it kind of reflects everything I learned about Fiona by reading it. And now by doing the interview, the cover is really gorgeous and provocative. You know, she's she's standing there naked with her, her fire that she's dancing with. Uh, she's got photos through the book of her smiling with rock stars like Gene Simmons and Gwen Stefani or next to the plane that she flies on aid missions through the Caribbean. It all shows all of this love and this pride for the other people in her life and all of the things that she's really accomplished. And she's got really, really great punny titles all the way through that really made me laugh out loud. Near the end, she's got one I really like. It's not a pun, but it's, it makes me laugh, which is that <laughs> uh, an airplane is more comfortable than a broomstick. And <laughs> that comes up again during the interview. And it's, it's probably my favorite part of the whole interview. And despite all the really fun um, rock facts and, and photographs and uh, a little bit of dirt on Tom Jones, you know, it's not on you. She will love Tom Jones. <laughs> um, my favorite thing about The Naked Witch really is just seeing Fiona's like drive to survive and to recreate herself over and over. 
her story's not over, obviously. <laughs> She's still going. But near the end of the book, you get this moment where you get to feel really, really happy for Fiona and you get to feel really, really happy that you see that her life is improving. You can see how hard she's worked and the great things that she's doing now and how far she's come. And it's a really, really inspirational story, especially if you are more in the middle of your lifetime and maybe struggling right now or, or just coming out of the struggle a lot like I am now. I found this story really, really inspirational in a way that someone just like me who is really creative and who struggles and who has self-esteem issues and family problems and is a witch can completely change their lives as many times as they feel they need to and can come out on top and just become better and better versions of themselves every time. Awesome. Just amazing. So, I mean, when you get right down to the book, it, the real message is that Fiona is just herself. She is determined to just be herself and make it in this world as herself. So she is the naked witch in all of the ways that she's the witch without any of the trappings of fame, her synthetic dreadlocks and vinyl pentacle outfits, um, and all of the baggage that kind of comes with things like witchcraft and stardom. It's a really, really great story. And it's a really great interview. <laughs> She's she's really, really great. I'm so excited for you guys to listen to the interview. We are going to talk a lot about her her life story, a lot of the stuff you, you hear in the book, some of the behind the scenes stuff, like how it feels to still be working in a male dominated industry, how she respects and admires things like the, the current women who are coming through and making drastic changes, especially in the entertainment industry and in the field of work and to do with our, our sexual rights and our freedoms and our safety. Um, we talk about whether or not she's a feminist, which is a resounding fuck yeah. And I totally, totally respect that. So I'm going to stop talking for a little while. <laughs> I know that's odd on our first episode ever. Um, and before I, I get to the interview, I just want to say that I have been getting all of your messages and your comments. And I've been seeing posts on places like Tumblr and Facebook that say, you know, the Fat Feminist Witch hasn't updated her podcast. She hasn't released an episode in a while. I really, really hope she's still going. I am still going. Uh, I needed a little bit of break, some because of technical issues. I had to get a whole new computer and some just because I, I personally needed a break. I've got lots of more episodes coming up. I've got an episode that is not an interview in the works shortly. So don't worry, I'm still here. So let it, let's get to our interview with Fiona Horn, the Naked Witch. Excellent. I'm, I'm so excited uh, to have you on the show. Thank you so much. I loved, loved The Naked Witch. I loved it so much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was, um, I, I love memoirs, especially to do with um, women in the music industry. And it was so, I mean, what a wild ride. <laughs> you, you've led a very yeah. interesting life so far. I guess so. I, um, I mean, the time in the band, I, you know, in the 90s, it was, uh, I mean, gosh, you know, really to, to talk about as a woman in music, um, I'd have to track all the way back to the 80s. <laughs> and uh, the, book, the book talks about um, when I was, uh, when I formed at the time the, the first, well, it was one of two all-female punk bands in Australia. There was Gash in Melbourne, now pretty hardcore metal punk. Yeah. And then there was The Mothers, um, as in motherfuckers, as in all the, you know, that, that genius name I came up with, you know, as a <laughs> as a, a kick against the dominant paradigm, you know, in, in my attempt to convert it, all those big words I used to try and drop back then, um, I, uh, I, I sort of had more of a, I was more influenced by suicidal tendencies and more of that uh, US surf it. culture, punk, and that's kind of what influenced the mothers in our songwriting and um, you know, and over over the course of of the mothers, you know, from the late, you know, I think it was like reformed in well in the late eighties, like eighty eight, eighty nine, I think. I um, we went through a few lineup changes, and ultimately ended up a couple of girls, a couple of guys. But but the goal was always to sort of put put us girls on stage, and um, we could barely play our instruments, but it didn't matter. We learned <laughs> fast together <laughs> and ended up having you know a bit of success back then it was like oh my biggest dream in the world would be to have a seven inch single I mean there was still vinyl it was you know and the seven inch single came out drives me wild and then it was like oh maybe a 12 inch and so then we put out 12 inch 
again, with that double entendre of 12 inch, uh, or, you know, referencing the male phallic dream, <laughs> supposedly, and, and also the fact that our vinyl was 12 inches diameter. So it was just kind of this um, really, really, really fun time. And I, I'm grateful and happy that I got to do that, you know, that I, that I didn't give up on that and that just kept uh, forging along. I mean, I taught myself, the book talks about how I taught myself to play guitar as a remedy to coming off heroin, you know, this bizarre short-lived, relatively short-lived, it's about a year, that I was strangely into heroin as I lived on the streets. I mean, the book talks about it all and, and how I kind of cleaned myself up by becoming a musician. <laughs> kind of what, it seems almost the opposite. It and then Death so Effects, you know, the 90s band. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and Death Effects was born of that. And that, that kind of, you know, my career is in Death Effects for seven years. You know, we were a popular Australian band. Um, and we came to America and uh, in uh, the early 90s, the book talks about it. And and then behind it all was, was this growing kind of connection and identification inside as a witch you know, work, working, uh, walking a path of goddess-oriented spirituality and whilst I'm working in this very male-dominated industry and, you know, it was an interesting time but all, I kept all the witchcraft in the broom closet, so to speak, and then, then in 97 when the band broke up, a book came, you know, I had the opportunity to do a book but, you know, I'm I'm waffling on a lot, Paige, but that kind of puts it all in context is how it just, you know, my autobiography kind of tracks this journey of a human being doing all this stuff, but it was all fairly, um, it, it was all fairly indicated. Like it was, other than, as, as I kind of went through the, the experiences of life and, and the losses, you know, as, you know, I talk about the band being murdered the way it was broken up. I, yeah. You know, I had a similar experience with the mothers with the first band. It was I didn't write about it in the book, so you're probably getting a scoop, but it was, <laughs> the way the mothers broke up was literally like an ambush as well. It was like, the other members showed up and just all three of them said, we don't want to do it anymore. Oh, my God. And that was so it. Difficult. And it was at rehearsal and they were gone and that was it. And I I found in life, um, I think a big lesson for me that I hope the book shares usefully is that, you know, every time things were taken, I mean, I've had things taken away yeah. and uh, I've been thrown down many more mm-hmm. times and I've been given things and, and picked up. But I've learned that, uh, for all the failures in life, I've got really good at one thing, and that's not giving up. And I don't know what it is in, in me. Maybe it's my father's genes. He's a Holocaust survivor. I mean, I'm half Hungarian Jew, half Aryan German. I'm, I've got this survivor gene instinct in me. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know, but I just don't give up. And uh, I really think, I would hope that the book shares a message that it's not how many times you're thrown down, it's how many times you get back up that really counts. That was definitely the message that I got from the book. I, I noticed that almost all of these things in your life, they ended very abruptly. You know, just like you were saying with the band, mm. it was just one day it was over. And it mm. seems like just as quickly you're like, okay, well, let's do something else now. And you would move on to something else and throw yourself right into it. The whole it book sounds about- sweet, but at the time it felt like it was going on forever. Like it's in the book, it sort of talks about it like, I, okay, I'll reinvent myself. Okay, <laughs> I'll reinvent myself again. But in the... The time between the the definitive, you know, clear cut paths were very. I mean, some of them stretched on for months um, sure. and even years. Uh, and you know, those those periods in between are kind of grey. Um, and you know, I, I remember particularly, you know, after death of sex, as I said, was murdered. I I just was like. I remember just walking around the streets at night. I, I talk about it in the book. You know, I would I just walk at the time I was living in the city of Melbourne in Australia and I was living in a two room apartment above a gas station and it was all gone. It was just like so bizarre and so quick and and yet I was still being featured on the cover of magazines and shit but everything was over. It was so, such a strange feeling. I felt so torn. And uh but I would just pace the streets all night. Lucky I didn't get bloody I don't know. <laughs> like, get I, get or or I know. I just, yeah, I was just back the back lanes of Melbourne, just pacing and pacing and pacing and trying to work out what can I do, what can I do, and then somehow gradually it all started piecing itself together. The way the way that I understand that now, 
all these years later, physical years later, I mean, age is just a number, but, you know, all these, you know, these years of journeying in the physical realm later, I, I can see now that what was happening was not, was not me as much as it was, you know, this kind of, the way I perceive it now is almost like the universe around me conspiring to put me on the next thing that I was meant to do. Um, I used to feel so torn apart and, and on the receiving end of life. And now I realize that um, I'm not really here to receive, I'm here to give. And, and it's a very peaceful comprehension of life now. If I can define the purpose of my life by being of useful service, whatever shape, way, form that the universe puts me in, so life's not about money, life's not about amassing goods, life's about actually now becoming less, not more, very different to how I used to live. <laughs> and uh, just, just kind of try to show up and be useful. And uh, that's, um, everything gets taken care of and everything works out and I feel happy and that's such a, a blessing. I can be happy even when the worst shit is going down around me. I mean, sometimes... And still, you know, my job, like the industry I work in, aviation now, and another one of these male-dominated environments is just really, sometimes really bewilderingly ridiculous and frustrating. Oh, I bet. And yet I I can take a deep breath, have compassion for the idiots, (laughs) and and understand it's almost like what Jesus said on the cross, forgive them, Lord, they know not what they do. They're just doing what everyone's been doing for the last hundred years since the invention of aviation. Eventually, a balance will be implemented. It's getting better. You know, there's more female pilots now than ever. It's getting better. That's so just kiss, keep it chilled, have compassion, show up, be useful, and get out of your own way. And, and then it all works out. So, you know, and I feel happy. I, I can find a way to feel happy every day. It's such a blessing. That is, that's so fantastic. I, um, I love that you went and you got your commercial pilot license, you know, for mostly the specific purpose of delivering aid missions and is that really when you notice that you were you were giving all of the time and, and helping all of these people? Is that when you notice that things kind of started to change for you and you felt like you could be a little bit more happy and at, and at peace with yourself? Well, the, the other the other part of the the equation that I should have probably made clear is it's the day I learned to give without expecting anything in return. Yeah, um, because you know. Through all my years of being a very public witch and, you know, the world's favourite witch, the world's hot <laughs> witches, uh, or, you know, what's the owner of the hot witches, Ryan Seacrest, called that kindly, <laughs> very nice bloke. You know, in that period of time where my spiritual life became my career and I was a very public person, spokesperson about witchcraft, it was for that, you know, that decade or more, actually, about 15 years I was doing that after the band. Um, I... Uh, I always thought I was giving, you know, just, just, but it was from this perspective of, oh, like everyone else is, I, I've got to suffer all the sadness in the world so that I can commiserate and, and, and empathize with people and help them. I've got to, you know, this is just reminding you how good you are, Fiona, but you're never going to be good enough. How near you are, but you're still so very far. And, you know, here you go, let's pick you up so you can be thrown down. Help these people so you can be shit on like a doormat. Yeah. Like, it was just this crazy crazy self-destruct mechanism and it, and it, and it kept t- triggering a, you know, a, 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 an unsustainable state of living. Um, I fell in love at a point after many years of, you know, the book talks about it, of being living in Los Angeles, the entertainment industry, surrounded by so many people, yet so alone, feeling so alone, for me, all the time. <laughs> and it was like, I just, but I fell in love, I started skydiving at the age of I don't know, physical age of 40, which, you know, you've already had quite a bit of experience stacked up, quite a lot of baggage in your brain, your heart, your soul and your body. But I fell in love and I fell, like, deeply in love and, and uh, left the entertainment industry pretty much mostly to go and live in a, in Bakersfield, California with my love and make a home and have our two fur babies and jump out of airplanes together as a pilot. <laughs> but then that ended, um, you know, very painfully, again, very abruptly. Bang, one day it's gone, gone. Yeah. And you just like, uh, and that began a descent into, you know, I tried to drink myself to death, basically. I was trying to survive and also just trying to die. 
And uh, but it was such a gift, and I'm so grateful that that he did it the way he did it, um, that he ended it the way he did because I needed that slap in the face, um, that 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 do or die moment again. Obviously, the universe wanted me to. Okay, here we go. Take it all away. <laughs> what are you going to do with it? And I got very sick, but through that, I was able to get on a path of wellness and recovery. I got sober in a 12-step program, and and I stay sober a day at a time. You know, it's like in nearly six years now, and it it really is. And the book talks about it. You know, it's 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 burst me into a way of living that I feel is so it's the best yet, and and it's not the it, it gives me an opportunity to be, I guess, the best version of myself I can be. Yeah. Again, being of useful service, it allowed me to not only want to be a pilot and work delivering aid, and the book talks about how I stumbled upon that whole thing of travelling down to Mexico, wasted drunk, seeing these mm-hmm. these kids in villages with no teeth, wondering how this is possible, and I'm talking about a flying doctor's service and just, you know, planted a seed in, in the illness and somehow... You know, along the journey, I got sober, and I guess the oh, the, the it just I had to have it all taken away to be able to find myself. I could never have done any of this without going through that that yeah. dark. When I met my biological mother, as an adopted, and again the book talks about that. When I did meet her, one of the things she said at a point in our friendship was. Fiona, when you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, crawl through it and like the bloody thing yourself. And I was like, yep. That's fantastic <laughs> it's true. advice. Yeah. Such fantastic yeah. advice. You, the book, yeah. it's just, it's so, I was actually really excited by the time I got to the part of the book where you're talking about uh, getting sober. I was so excited. I'm like, oh my God, this is so good. Something good is happening. <laughs> The whole, the whole yeah, because it, like it, I... it got pretty low for a while there. I mean, but, you know, it's, again, it was that thing of um, I've had that in me all the time. Was you're good, but you're just not good enough, you know. Yeah. And and ultimately, it was unsustainable. It was a clock ticking away for self destruction. And you know, it's it's interesting when I look at some of my other my peers. You know, like I look at from the era that I was in music in the nineties, and, and you know, very sad event last year when the lead singer of Soundgarden, Chris Cornell, you know, hung himself, which I find bewildering. I I, um, just, because I met him, we hung out, we toured, the band toured with Soundgarden and, you know, I look back and he and I are the same age and I look in physical years and uh, I look, I remember him and what he was like, even though we only hung out a couple of evenings with different, you know, just as mates, you know, on tour yeah. and just got wasted, just drunk basically together and on the big day out tour and back in 90, I don't know what it was, 94 or 95 or something. But um, we, uh, I think, how did it, how did he hang himself and how am I still here, you know, and and he he went in and out of recovery programs, and ultimately, my understanding, you know, from what his generous wife yeah. released to the media, which must have been a heartbreaking statement for her to say he was on prescription medication, and he said he'd taken too much that night. Yeah. Dr- swapping out one drug for another, I, you know, I humbly offer doesn't work. I, my sobriety is, you know, like I said, a twelve step program, and I've been very blessed to comprehend the spiritual aspect of it, and I, I. That my, my willpower ran out decades ago, but my the, my idea of a higher power is what keeps me in the program and allows me to stay. And I just I just know that I just got that I've got that in my mind and in my heart. And um and I think of you know other people I know who have passed who are from my era, and I just, it just again makes me so grateful that I somehow was able to know that. I didn't have to do that. But I was on the same path as self destruct without a doubt. We've lost so many incredible musicians, especially I, I feel like I was such a big fan of music in the 90s. I've actually been listening to Def FX all morning. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and like, I, I was well, like, you, you know, know I, I, I hope you like this. it because we're not, we weren't the greatest band in the world, but on stage, man, we just, I mean, it was just, it looked like so much fun. Out. So oh much fun. Oh my God, fun. so much fun. 
It was hardcore, you know, like just we weren't the greatest songwriters. God knows I'm not the greatest singer, but there was just something we had live that just went to dirt. Maybe it was me, maybe it was our chemistry. We had a few lineup changes, but it was great. It was so it's just this ability to connect, you know, yeah. and, and go hard. It's so much fun. Yeah, actually, I was on I was on YouTube and I was looking up videos because the song sounded familiar, and I was like, I probably saw music videos. I had when I was younger for sure. But in the yeah, there was yeah, yeah. There, there was a time we were on we were kind of you know we had some charting songs. You know, it was, it was when MTV actually played music. We were on it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And as a young, like I was a little Wiccan in the '90s, and I remember. I remember that video where you're wearing that white vinyl outfit with the pentacle on your stomach and thinking that that was just the <laughs> coolest thing I've and that, ever and that, seen. And that song was called I'll Be Your Magic. And it, it's funny, actually, that was our last album, the Magic album, before the band was just, in, you know, broken up by the guys. And um, But that, that album was really the first one where I overtly came out and said I was, you know, like I really, the lyrics were really... Uh, reflecting my interests and life as a witch behind the scenes, but still hadn't officially come out of the broom closet. But but it was kind of announced during yeah. that album, and um, and then you know then then Sean, the co-founder, broke the band up on April first, nineteen ninety seven. Bang over, and and it was like that. But that was that started me writing books about witchcraft, and all of a sudden I'm launched into this life as a poster girl for the <laughs> the modern witch movement of the late 90s early 2000s and it was the a whole days. and I can look back now and see that at the time I was all caught up in you know working in the entertainment industry as a professional and here I am performing my spiritual path now and, and it's become my job and and I felt kind of a bit lost in it a lot of the times and and you know and and yet I just kept doing what I felt I was supposed to do what was expected yeah. of me, what my publishers expected, what the public expected, and and yet inside I was kind of feeling increasingly cut off from my spiritual life, and you know trying to find it, trying to feel it again. And then when I decided to really step away, when I got sick, you know, really sick with the alcohol, and when I got sober, uh, it gave me an opportunity to reconnect with my inner witch, I guess. And and here I am now, you know, saying you know nearly six years sober, working as a commercial pilot, living in the Caribbean and all which all the time. It's, it's, it's uh, and here, and I get this opportunity to write my autobiography, which really came out of the blue. The book talks about how I got this tap on the shoulder from an old publisher through social media <laughs> and it felt, and I, get, I prayed on it in my own way and meditated on it. Why should I do, should I do this universe? Why? You know, I, I'm not in it for fame, acclaim, certainly not money, nothing. I don't have much money. I don't really, I don't care. care. Yeah. I just, the green the green stuff isn't relevant. I'm, I'm poor as far as green stuff goes and very wealthy in <laughs> other areas, which I think are more important, happiness of heart. And, and I do a lot of stuff by trade, you know, totally donate a lot great. of my time. It all works out, you know. Um, but the, uh, the opportunity to write the book, I thought, could it be useful and, the guidance was, yes, it will be useful, Fiona. And I didn't realise, I thought it would be useful for everyone else, but it turned out to be useful for me. I, it, the book ended up being a healing experience for me. I thought I'd already done a fair chunk of healing, but there was more to be done. And that's, uh, so the book was good for me too. I've actually read it. I don't read my books generally. All the books I've written, I tend to just write them, edit them, give them to the publisher and just think, oh, thank yeah. God that's over. Um, now I've got to go and promote it. But this is, I've read this book, I've read my book about three times. It's pretty full on. First book I've ever read of my own. <laughs> I was actually <laughs> going to ask because I, while I was reading this, I, I, I was thinking, I can't imagine digging all of this up and, and pouring all of this out. I just can't imagine going through this whole life, life and, and pouring it all out like that. I can't imagine remembering anything I've written after. So I was. Oh, actually it, it, it comes if back, yeah. Back when you it, let yeah. yourself dip into your life, when you give yourself permission to to really, you know, plow through the the vaults of your brain, it's all still there. All the feelings, um, all the good feelings, and definitely all the bad feelings that yeah. we've 
there were times, I mean, I wrote this book in a lot of different places around the world, as it turns out. I wrote the first chunk of it in Africa. I was doing a bush pilot course up there, and that's when the tap on the shoulder came from the old publisher, and I'm kind of sitting out in Africa looking at elephants and <laughs> thinking, okay. And I had my laptop with me. Um, I don't know why I took it. Yeah. I think I took it because of the bush pilot course, and <laughs> it was to help with some of the materials we had to do. Yeah. But I had it. I started writing. Um, a lot of stuff poured out. I think because I was in a neutral space, but it reminded me of Australia. The continent of Africa, I was in South Africa at the time up near the Kruger National Park, and the colours and the smell of the land reminded me of Australia, the bush I grew up in. And I think that triggered memories, and then it just started pouring out. And then I, I wrote chunks of the book, you know, on the island of St. Croix on, in the, when I came back to the Caribbean where I was living then, and then I moved to San Juan in Puerto Rico to work flying a plane over there and I wrote in a, in a historical old home that my friends owned that I was house-sitting for them. and You know, all these different spots. And then St. Thomas, where I am now, which is another part of the U.S. Virgin Islands. I, um, all these neutral zones that, that allowed me just, you know, I'd kind of, it's like what I used to do in the old days when I write a book is stick my desk or area up against a wall. More often than not, like, so that I could just go into my brain. Yeah. And... Uh, even though when I was writing it in Africa, I had elephants and warthogs and various other things running around in front of me. Uh, in San Juan and St. Croix and St. Thomas, I just looked at walls, but I knew that world was around me outside and just allowed me to go deep. And I think maybe that was part of all the healing too because it allowed me to really forgive myself. And I say this in the book, like in reliving it all now with the perspective I have for the physical years I've had on this planet now, just half a century, more than half a century, um, I was finally really able to forgive myself for all the times I fucked up. And that was very, uh, oh, it's just good to let go of all of that, you know. Yeah, yeah that was, um, I, I found the book really inspirational, especially I'm going through a lot of my own issues right now and seeing someone you know, go through a lot of the same stuff and, and come out. I'm, I'm in my 30s now. So seeing that at 50, it doesn't have to suck and things can be great and you can start over and things can be good and you can, can actually be better. Things can be better yourself. than ever. <laughs> it's just it's yeah. nice to know that I still have time to do that. And I've noticed that I've seen that in a lot of other reviews of the book that it's it's inspirational to know that no matter what age you are, you can still become your best self and you can shed this stuff that that really was painful and you can become someone really good that you can be proud of and that can make you mm. feel spiritually connected. That, that I, I'm, I'm so happy to hear you sort of sum it up like that because that was my greatest hope in writing it was to to be able to, you know, touch people in that way because it touched me, you know, and I had, I actually, I remember one of my favorite messages from people. It's, it's been wonderful to just have so much beautiful feedback from people coming through social media and through, um, I mean, because, you know, when my last books were out, Facebook wasn't that big. It's huge now, but I've got to remember Facebook only came out in the last 10 years. So I'm trying to be, you know, my last book prior to this one was almost a decade ago. So it's like, you know, um, it's amazing to just be able to connect with people with the social media and uh, and also emailing me through my website and it's just beautiful feedback. One lady, she's in her seventies in physical years and and she uh, just said, "Wow, you know, I've read your book. I realised a few things I want to do still. I want to go and do them." And I was like, "Yes, that's amazing. <laughs> I love it. That's so awesome. That's I mean, perfect you know, feedback really, right there. Age, age is just a number, and I, and I really think that as women in in a you know modern Western society in particular, we're just really encouraged to sort of consider ourselves to have a use by date. As even as much as there's much more of a nod now to the empowerment of women outside of an age-related condition, I, I still, you know, I don't watch the news. I don't read women's magazines especially. I mean, I might read National Geographic or Flying Magazine or something or Plane and Pilot, but I avoid all that, that, that indoctrination, all that, the, like that subliminal programming that, that occurs with, mainstream media, I really try to avoid it as much as I can. Like even going, if I have to go into the bank or into somewhere that has a TV playing, I put my head down. I consider it pollution. Like it would be. I stick my face next to someone smoking? No. Yeah. So I, I don't watch all that shit. Um, it really I, can I be. I want to be free. 
Yeah, it really. I, can yeah, be I don't. I don't lately. think we have to. We're destined to live. I say this in the book. You know, we're. You know that we have to live to. You know, grow old, get sick, and die expensively, mm-hmm. or, or you know, it's. I refuse to live like that. Um, yeah. And if the, if the second half of my life, as I hope I'm embarking upon it, is a journey of learning how to die well, then I think that's a good journey to have. I mean, we only get to die once. I want to do it really well. I want to die in good health, with peace of mind and gratitude and, and a healthy, clear mind. I want to experience my death and I want to experience the transition. And um, And, you know, that's something I think about now that I'm sort of, getting ready to, to do well. It's like, you know, I, I think it's, I, I don't, I'm not going to buy into the, buy into the myth that, that, you know, our bodies are designed to fail and, and, and cancer and, and mental decline is inevitable. Fuck that. Yeah. I mean, I became a pilot. Part of becoming a pilot as well was to keep my mind really, really sharp because I realized as I was coming out of the drinking and that my mind was soft and soggy. And mind's a muscle, you know, you exercise your brain. And so I, you know, what I have to do from, a, you know, a mechanistic point of view with operating an aircraft of, of just the stuff, the volume of stuff you've got to learn. I mean, my God, I mean, I left school at 14 and hot, left home at 14. It's mind-blowing. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. I can only um, imagine. I don't even drive a car, so I can't even imagine. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't drive a car until I was in my thirties. I didn't think I could operate heavy machinery. Yeah. I was like, I just let everyone else drive me around. And, and, I'd, <laughs> and back in those days, I was famous, so I had bloody chauffeurs and shit. You know, I was yeah. like, God. <laughs> um, no, I just uh, no. I started driving in my thirties too. It was like, um, but you know, it's it's amazing what you can do when you just get out of your own way and go and think fuck it, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and I had this goal. I wanted to be a service. I, I had this dream and, and I had been I'd have been lucky to have the opportunity to fly an airplane owned by my ex who was a guy that I fell in love with who was a pilot and he gave me some lessons and it just, especially when it ended the way it did with him, when I when I got sober after all of that, um, I, uh, I just, I realised as well I wanted to make sense of the time he and I had had together yeah. and, 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 and turn it into something good. I mean, it was good. I, I, I have no regrets and, you know, the drinking just got really bad after we broke up. But, but I realise now looking back that I was slowly tipping into a kind of decline. I was drinking like all my other girlfriends, you know, hey, you know, meet up for wine at 5 o'clock and, you know, he would come home from flying all day and I'd have a nice bottle of bread and some cheese and crackers set out and, you know, we'd drink that bottle of wine and then we'd probably crack one more to watch our favourite TV show at the end of the night and have a half a glass more each. But that kind of drinking creeps up on you, man, and, and that's how people get really addicted to alcohol, yeah. especially when they're in their, you know, when, when it's not cute and fun to do shots in your 20s in theory, you know, like, oh, yeah, shots, 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 shots. And, <laughs> you know, you get into your physical 30s and 40s, it, it's not as cute anymore. Yeah, <laughs> and you don't recover changes. as well as you used to. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, as a society, we're encouraged even more to try to anesthetize ourselves, whether yeah. it's with, you know, excessive consumption of alcohol, which the mainstream media and advertising just slams on us at, Oh, be cool, drink this brand of alcohol, you know, and wine is the solution, you know, it's just all this dumb crap that especially is thrown at women to keep us soft, and to keep yeah. us malleable and, and manipulative and, and easy to manipulate. So fuck that. I also don't drink because I'm an anarchist. I refuse to just buy into that shit. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, it, I love what you said. It's, wine is as a culture is like so thrown at women you need to be drinking wine mm. all the time when you're with your friends drink wine when you go out to dinner drink wine when you're so i hate it yourself, it's drink so wine. not necessary yeah yeah i've seen and it's it just a lot to more keep us lately. keep us done it's just to keep us done and drunk and yeah. powerless and 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 needing answers because we can't find them within and it just makes us you know easily manipulated consumers to feed yeah. the beast and i'm like fuck that <laughs> I did. I did that for a long time, and I used to be proud of being able to drink everyone else under the table. I consider that a great accomplishment. Yeah. I mean, my God, I'd rather I'd rather um, go and fly a plane to Haiti with three hundred and fifty chicks on it and feed school kids for a year. Those, those eggs, those chicks that I delivered 
It was my first aid mission early last year, 350 laying chicks. And now laying so many eggs on this island of Illavash in Haiti that they're exceeding the production needed to feed the 300 school kids and the 500 families. So now we're starting a buy an egg donation campaign where um, people on the mainland outside of Haiti can can chip in 20 bucks a month to cover the cost of delivering the eggs to other communities in Haiti for food. You know, and it's like I'd much rather be doing that than drinking overpriced fucking wine. (laughs) (laughs) That is definitely... (laughs) I, I, that is definitely something to be proud of, for sure. Um, throughout the book, I, I, I loved the parts where you said, I heard this voice, I heard the goddess, or I heard divinity, I heard God talking to me. Do you still hear that voice, and do you still practice magic and, and witchcraft where you live in the Caribbean? Well, I, I kind of, I mean, it's, I, think I, I think I touched on it earlier in our chat, but, you know, all witch all the time, it's, um, it's just a part of, who and what I am, I realise now it's it's me, it's been me all along. Um, so do I consciously go out of my way to practice witchcraft? No, it's just a part of everything. Um, do I have an altar at home? Yes. Uh, do I sit in front of it and light candles and do all that? Not usually. It's there, though. I, I, I let go of a lot of the props and, and um, gimmicks of witchcraft, and I, but I still have my affirmé, the same mermaid handled double bladed knife that I got at Eye of the Cat a billion years ago in Long Beach, California when Death Effects first one I'm sure back in early like ninety one or something like <laughs> ninety two maybe. Um I got that mermaid affirme there and I've kept that all these years. Uh I have some stones from the riverbed in Outback Australia that I collected there back when Death Effects had the opportunity to go into the outback and I still have a few few stones from the riverbed. I have a few things uh, that are kind of props, I guess, of my craft, but the way I practice now is um, is just immediate and intuitive, whether I put my feet in the ocean or I, you know, pick up a feather and, and place it somewhere because I, I'm carrying the sentimental goal of a of a concept to and, and hoping that it will find its wings. I mean, it, it, it's all very intuitive and very very organic now and actually you know it's I guess I've got a bit of fun news to share that just happened uh, my publishers of the autobiography have said would you like to do another book and um, it would be about uh, about practicing this kind of this kind of eco eco friendly witchcraft that I do now this, this no frill no props kind of just organic witchcraft um, and so yeah I'm going to do it I think it'll I'll write it this year and and it will be my first how-to in some time because, you know, it's incredible that the very first book I did, which is Magical Journey, when it was published under a different title in Australia, but Harper Collins decided to release the 20th anniversary edition. So cool. the same year, which was kind of last year really, the year the autobiography came out was also the year the 20th anniversary of my first book came out. And now I'll be able to, you know, in this beginning of this next two decades, write another one. So I'm, I'm really grateful and happy for that opportunity it feels like it's appropriate so I'll do it I'm really excited I was actually going to ask if you have plans for more witch books because I I liked your witch books when I was a, a young witch and I was still learning I liked them a lot my library had three or four of them <laughs> in the oh, early thank 2000s you. they had quite a few yeah and I used to check them out all the time <laughs> that's lovely to hear I mean I you know it's I have a couple of them still and there's still a, a few in print too um and when I look at them I the other day I looked at one that I wrote called Bewitch a Man and because um, uh, Witch Way magazine did a review of it with M- Michael Herkes, who's a lovely guy, a witch that I know, he wrote the review of it because of Valentine's and Love Issue yeah. and this Bewitch a Man book that came out you know, quite a number of years ago and found out still in, still in print and still doing its thing and, um, and I had a glance through it and, uh, you know, it, I can see that, that there, even though I felt cut off at the time, me personally, there was something coming through me that was useful information, and it, and, I, and I can kind of look back at that stuff and enjoy it and think that it, the way it was presented and delivered was there was a there was an appealing friendliness to it that I think a lot of the books I read when I was sort of coming out of the closet were pretty heavy, you know, yeah. Spiral Dance, like Starhawk, where the Goddess Light One. 
like all these kind of pretty heavy, you know, very dark, ritualistic, dark, but just, yeah. just, <laughs> just very ritualistic, very, very intellectually intense, like, like in the sense of you've got to know all this exactly like this to do it properly or you're not a real witch and yeah. all this pressure. And so to feed and fuel doubt. And when I look at my books, it was more like, yeah, here you go, try this. <laughs> see, see what happens and see what you think, see what you feel. And that's what and I liked this is, about this. Them. Is the, this, and that was, it made it more uh, friendly. And I think that was relevant at the time. You know, and that I had the opportunity to write a new forward for the 20th anniversary edition of the first one, the re release. And, uh, and I wrote that. I wrote 20 years ago. The world was a different place. And witchcraft, even for witches, was shrouded in myth, suspicion and fear. Yeah. And nowadays, who doesn't know a crowd self-proclaimed witch or Wiccan? You know, it's, you know, the religion of witchcraft. It's, 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 uh, I think it's more open for seekers to find information, but it ultimately is an occult path. And that's the dark side of it, is the inner world of it that, that ultimately you... You know, there's a beautiful analogy that in the darkest night, the brightest stars shine. And I think as witches, we, we walk into the dark night to find the stars and, and experience their, their beauty and their magnificence. And that light is, you know, what guides us on the path. So um, witchcraft will always be a dark path, but it's uh, but for that reason, not because there's something evil about it. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's because it's universal, it's magical, and out of the darkness comes the light, you know. And you can't you can't see the light if you don't know what darkness is. You have to find both. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's I think about that. You know, as a witch, like now, you know, my job at the moment is flying the newspapers. I get up at three in the morning and I fly a Piper Aztec multi-engine twin-engine aircraft uh, from the island I live on. I load about two hundred to three hundred pounds of newspapers, and uh, I fly it to another island and I unload the papers and. I fly across the ocean at night and uh, like it's the dark moon now so the, the sky is very black and the stars are very bright and we've had pretty clear nights, a bit of weather lately, a bit of cloud and rain and stuff but the last couple of nights have been really clear and I was just flying like, like last night and the night before and just, you know, I had the Southern Cross in front of me and the, and the, the Scorpion constellation to the left of that and, and the stars were so bright because the sky was so dark. I just felt so blessed to be flying alone in a plane with all the newspapers, being in service, delivering the news, even though I'm not a fan of, of the media, but mm -hmm. since we went through two catastrophic hurricanes on our islands in this area of the world only five months ago, our communication mm -hmm. system is still pretty poor. The paper is often the only way people can find out what yeah. restaurants are open, what shops are open, what doctors are, are kind of functioning right now, what dentists are open. So the, the news service, I feel delivering the news is a service that I'm grateful to offer. Yeah, um, and so I do it. Yeah, but, you know, I get to fly in the dark night and uh, a lot of people are kind of, you know, go, oh, it's dangerous flying over the ocean at night. Well, you know, I, um, I, I, I'm trained as a commercial pilot to weigh up the risks and assess the, the likelihood of a successful outcome to the mission. And I, you know, I just, Follow the rules because they're usually right, and I fly the plane as safely and conservatively as, as as I feel appropriate, and deliver the news. And I get to see extraordinary things. But you know, which flying across the ocean at night, looking at the stars. Well, I contemplate all that stuff, even as I'm operating heavy machinery as a commercial pilot. I'm still very spiritually connected to my universe, my world, my experience of it as a witch. Yeah. And, and I have to say, a plane is much more comfortable plane, than a broomstick. Much more comfortable. Yeah, you got it. You got that punchline. And it is much more comfortable than a broomstick. <laughs> I loved that. I really laughed out loud when I read that. It's, it's really so true. So it's so true. <laughs> I'm really not making that up. It's so way more, more comfortable. comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> <sighs> I love the idea of a witch flying across the dark ocean at night looking at the stars in her airplane. It's fantastic. I love it. What a way to modernize the idea of a witch. I love it so much. Um, we're so it's up to, true, you know. Yeah, we're coming up to 40 minutes, and I want to let you go if you have to go. Yeah, and just, yeah to thank ask, you. I've got to, got to go and do some things this afternoon. Perfect. I just wanted to ask, um, there's this really great, it's right near the beginning of the book. Let me see. So there's this amazing photograph 
um, a view at the big day out. And it says the national newspaper said, we don't know Fiona Horn knew she was making a powerful feminist statement when she removed her top at the big day out. And it says that you did. Do you still consider yourself a feminist? I know that that's kind of like a Definitely. scary word no, no, sometimes. But... No, it's not. It's a great word. Fantastic. Again, <laughs> I, don't, I refuse to buy into the myth of, of, of other people's opinions mattering. Um, no, feminism, feminist, absolutely, I'm a feminist, and I, I think it's a fantastic word, and uh, it's a brilliant movement and concept, and I'm grateful to all the strong, brave fucking groundbreaking women that came before me that allow me to be here now living my life the way I am. Um, and I will always be. Beautiful. There's nothing ashamed of in that time of it. <laughs> fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Fiona. This was fantastic. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> thank you so much for can you um, and... Can you send me um, a link for your, for your thing and I'll post it on my social media and I mean, if you if you put anything up on a website, if you if you're cool to put my website up, fionahorn dot com, because then there's links to all the social media pages I have, and I update them really regularly, like my Facebook and my Instagram, and love people if they're interested in my funny little life out here in the Caribbean. <laughs> and when we start launching this buying campaign to um, get the eggs out to more communities in Haiti, um, I'll be putting that on the social media. So yeah, Perfect. you can plug my website. That'd be awesome. I'll, I will plug everything. I have the review of the book going up today. You got uh, four crystal balls out of five, which is my, I absolutely love this book Thank you. review. Thank you. <laughs> and I will make sure to Thank plug you. all of your social media so that people can contact you and tell you how much they love your book. Cause I'm sure it's going to keep awesome. coming in. <laughs> Thank you. I really, I really hope it just kind of keeps doing its little thing, you know, the little ground swell. If it, I, my only hope is that, as it came out, was that it would reach the people who needed to read it. That's all I hope. So it's good. Well, honestly, I needed to read it, and it reached me, and I'm, I, I still feel a little bit like. I feel like this little burst of energy still, this this inspiration, like, yeah, I can keep going. I can keep doing this stuff. I can do something new, and you know, I'm. I'm not old. I know 30 sounds like an odd time to start thinking that, but I have lately. So I, I yeah, I, I think I think that's you kind of unfortunately you're just getting hammered by the mainstream culture yeah. hitting you. Just you, you can just let that go. I mean, it's just. I mean, honestly, I the, I think that um, that catchphrase of inner child is is uh, it's kind of been thrown about a bit, and it can be more to down a way in a way but but if you don't define yourself by how many physical years you've been on the planet um then anything's possible I, I feel more childlike now in a sense of having a willingness to see the world as a magical place where anything's possible I feel more like that now I mean I, the way I live now it's the only other time in my life I can compare it to is from when I was zero to age five yeah. When you just don't know at that point what you can't do, anything's possible, then you start to become adulterated or abused, as in my case, and my horrible grandfather doing like awful shit to me. That really yeah. screwed me up. But, you know, that's all in the book. But, but my point is, like, yeah, you can, that, that idea of living free, free to, to just go for it, anchoring in a sense of, you know, I really, I really think the key to understanding how to live, for want of a better term, agelessly, um, but how to live infinitely in the present moment is to define your purpose as some way of being service. So get out of your own ego, get out of your own hang-up, get out of your own way. And every time you, you're kind of thinking of something to explore and do and try, see how it can be useful in the world. And if you anchor it with that intention and that goal, then the universe will conspire in your favor and help you um, realize those things. And, and you just continue to get more and more free and you just shed all the crap and it's beautiful. And I think that we're very lucky as humans to have an opportunity to live like this now. We're the, the biologically the healthiest and most resilient we've ever been as a species. Um, even though we're, we're conditioned to think we're sick and old and need medicine and need drugs and need all this wine and need all this crap, actually biologically we, we are really strong. Our life expectancy is long we've got lots of time and yeah but the, the most important time is right now a day at a time a day can feel infinite if you allow it to be that's so, fantastic 
Just I keep, love that. keep going for it. Don't give up ever. <laughs> yeah, I love that. A day can feel infinite if we want it to be. I love that. That's beautiful. That's it's really true. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry, I got All like, right, really Hazel. caught up. Thank you. I know I, I ended up saying we've we had 30 minutes. We've been talking for nearly an hour, but I will let you go. I'm going to run off and do my errands. Um, I look forward to seeing all that, and um, and uh, thank you. It's really lovely chatting with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on and, and for writing the book, and I really look forward to a new book. Really look forward to it a lot. Thank you, Paige. Thank you. I'll make sure my publishers know that so they'll, they'll – Day on me to finish it. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Thanks, hon. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, Fiona. Thank you so much for tuning in today's episode of the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast with Fiona Horn. Uh, thank you so much to Fiona and for for her publicist Sarah, <laughs> who really helped me work work the uh, the schedule out. I'm really really grateful that they got in contact to me. This was a really great interview, and I think it's an awesome way to start a whole brand new year. And transformation and resilience are going to be a really big theme with me throughout the whole year. So I really hope you guys come back for the next episode. If you like the show and you love what I do and, and you really want to help me get you know super mega famous, just kidding, sort of. Uh, <laughs> Do me a favor and subscribe to and review the show on iTunes or whatever platform you're using to listen to right now and share it with all of your really cool friends. Don't share it with your lame friends, but share it with your cool friends. It honestly really does make a huge difference in the show. So, of course, you can also go to fatfeministwitch.com. Watch out because the URL has changed a little bit. It's not the Fat Feminist Witch. It's just fatfeministwitch.com to read my latest blog posts and book reviews. You can connect with me on social media through the website there or connect with me directly. And you can even buy me a coffee. Look up in the little header bar. You'll see it. (laughs) So I'll have a new episode of the podcast for you in a few weeks time. But in the meantime, I want to know what's got you ranting, raving and wand waving lately. Do you have a witchy book you'd like me to review? Oh my God, did you write a witchy book you'd like me to review? Because I'd I'd love to read it. Uh, Do you have a topic you want me to address on the show or something you've seen in the news lately that you think is really relevant to witches and feminists and fat people? I want to hear about it. So you can go to my website and contact me there. You can find me all across social media, of course, because I am addicted. Uh, I can't wait for the next episode of the podcast. I'm so happy to be back to work. I missed you guys. So have a really great rest of your week, a really great magical rest of February, and I will have a new episode for you soon. I promise. Bye, everybody.